All right, let's get started here. All right, uh, my name is Alan Ranciato. I'm from Express Scripts, and we're talking about using Jenkins Pipeline today, how to do it in the enterprise. So I've been with Express Scripts, a little background for about a year now. I came in to basically drive the strategy around the DevOps initiatives, automation, and how to support our agile transformation. I've been in the software industry for about 18 years. Uh, I've been writing software for probably about 14 of those. This is my fourth Jenkins world. Um, so for about four years, I've been concentrating on making software better versus just writing software. Um, previously, I've done a lot of different things in my life. I'd like to show this slide because it shows me on vacation. And that's really my goal is to be on a phone-free vacation. Uh, and that's why we're here. We, we all just want to make things better. So when I came into Express Scripts, we basically looked at the organization. For, first off, before I go any further, has anybody here heard of Express Scripts? OK. We've got about 15% of the room. Um, <laughs> if you guys were to pull out your prescription cards from your health insurance, you'd probably see our name on it. We are the largest PBM, pharmacy benefit manager, in the country. Uh, about 25,000 employees, about 5,000 in technology. We're number 22 on the Fortune 500, probably the biggest company that you guys haven't heard of. Um, we, we've grown extremely fast over the years, um, quite often through M&A. So we've got a lot of different technologies on board, a lot of different uh, companies that we've acquired or merged with over the years, and a lot of problems to solve, just a lot of little pockets of technology. Um, size is definitely one of our issues that we've had to solve for. And, and as part of this, we're right now trying to do an agile transformation, trying to go from you know, the waterfall that we all know and hate to um, really sprinting and being able to release software fast and with quality. So you know, the problems we've encountered are size. We're very distributed. We've got a lot of people in a lot of places, a lot of different teams, a lot of different teams that don't necessarily communicate. Um, that are doing things their own way. Uh, we've got platforms all over the place. We, we've got things from newer stuff, um, Spring Boot running on an internal private cloud, to old web sphere services, to VB6 pockets out there, to mainframe, and really just a little bit of everything out there. And it's really been a big problem to solve to try to figure out what we're doing. Uh, we counted about a year ago, and we had 37, 37 different programming languages out in the wild. And just trying to get all that together and figure out how we can come up with a path to, one, know what we're doing, and two, do it better, to actually move things out the door and move things along. Um, we, we had different procedures to get code into production. Things like filling out remedy tickets, things like emailing binaries back and forth to people, Things like putting stuff on file shares, Nexus repos, Artifactory repos, just things everywhere and just not really knowing what we had and where things were. Um, and then we had pockets of automation. And, and I quoted automation because I don't really want to use air quotes in front of you guys. But <clears throat> really, the pockets of automation are scripts. They're, they're scripts that people run that, that we call things automated. That there, there's no reusability, there's no communicating what we have in different areas of the organization, and there's really no central how do we do things. Um, and then obviously the manual stuff that everybody knows about and everybody is here because we need to get rid of all the manual stuff. Um, so, so that was the big problem. And so somebody decided a while back that our solution was DevOps. And, and, and that's really what it was. It, it's DevOps. And that is the solution that we all know. Because if we're running the DevOps, we know we, we've got the problem solved. Unfortunately, what we did was the DevOps. And it was a lot of, you know, let, let's stand up a DevOps team. Let, let's take some people that people can spare. Let's put them together. And let's come up with something that works with someone, but not for everyone. And let's really try to build it in a silo rather than trying to really socialize it across the organization and put it all together. So I came in, and part of my role was to figure out how we can put all this together, how we can come up with a solution um, that provides 
really these key aspects of what we're doing. Um, ease of adoption is one of the big things. How do we get teams that have been doing things their own way for a really long time to do something different and to be able to do that in addition to their day jobs? Um, flexibility across the platforms because not everybody fits in the same box. We can't just tell everybody, all right, you need to uplift your code, do this. Uh, it's not going to happen. And you know, I did mention mainframe somewhere along the way. Um, visibility. So as we're going through our transformation, we really need to have visibility into what we're doing. How do we have metrics? How do we know what we're doing, how fast we're doing, how quickly we're adopting not only the tools, but the new processes, being able to get things out the door, our quality, and quality, obviously. Um, we need testing, we need automation, we need things to hook in and we need it to be easy. Um, and then of course, deployments, because you can move as fast as you want, but if you have to wait three weeks for somebody to deploy something and they're doing it manually, one, they're gonna mess up, and two, it's gonna take you three weeks. Um, and, and then just all the minutia around the process and all of the paperwork and the Excel spreadsheets going back and forth and finding out where we're actually deploying things and filling out service tickets and getting approvals from eight different VPs who have no idea what you coded but have to approve it to go into production. So removal of all that stuff. So what we did is we took a lot of the different technologies and the different things we did and we brought it all together and we did a lot of consolidation. So we initially had multiple source control systems. We, we have CVS, we have Harvest, um, we have Visual Source Safe sitting out there. And, and just a lot of different systems. And let's all consolidate. I mean, let, let's come up with a core. So we went with GitHub Enterprise, brought that in, um, and, and really tried to help teams get in it to actually start collaborating. It, being a distributed source control, it does allow teams to collaborate and work together and work differently as they're trying to go through this transformation. Um, and really what we did was we pulled our core around Jenkins and we said, all right, so GitHub is one of our key players, Jenkins is one of our key players. Jenkins can do all the heavy lifting and actually reach out to all of the other tools. So we see a lot of tools in here, but really Jenkins is the core center of what we're doing. So we're, we're using our pipeline libraries and that's why you guys are here to actually hook into that and to use Jenkins to hook into our workflows and our processes as we go. So kind of the solution going down the path was helping teams from an ease of adoption. How do we get them on board? So we, we built processes to bring them in from CVS and just simple Jenkins jobs that take them and uplift their code, move it into Jenkins, or move it into GitHub, build out a Jenkins file for them automatically based on the type of code they are, and, and just get them started. Obviously, there are changes that need to be made. There is some sort of manipulating and massaging the code to make it work the way we want it to work, because you know, when you're building locally on your machine and passing around files, it's a lot different than building in a centralized source. But it's one of the key aspects of being able to do this. Um, job DSL. So we use Jenkins to, uh, Job DSL to actually get them up and running. So nobody wants to go in and learn a new tool. Well, some of us do. But a lot of people don't want to go in and learn a new tool. They don't have time for that. So we built things like forms in Jenkins that just say, okay, put in your Git repo, boom. Build out a pipeline job, build out dashboards, build out all of that stuff for them so they can actually move on and it's a couple clicks of a button and we're done. Um, and then the global pipeline libraries, and we'll get into a little bit more of that in, uh, in a few minutes. But the global pipeline libraries, we built a library for the enterprise to use. And the library, really, the main part of it is the hooks across all our other tools. So as we bring in new aspects of what we're doing, we can add those into the pipeline that people are consuming, and they get the new features for free as we add new test capabilities, as we add new platforms, as we add new deployment capabilities, as we add new reporting functions, they get all that information for free without actually having to change their code, without having to change their projects, without having to go in and Jenkins and do that stuff. And we'll get into the details on that in just a little bit. But so what we did is we really just created a common workflow path across multiple platforms, across multiple languages, um, to really use Jenkins Pipeline to do that. Um, from a visibility perspective, we're pushing data out to Grafana for stats on our builds. 
We are capturing metrics in Splunk on testing and performance. We are hooking into JIRA for the status of where our code is and what we're doing. Um, and Jenkins is doing all of this stuff. Quality solutions. Uh, this is one of the interesting parts about what we're doing because we do have so many different technologies and we do have so much manual testing is how to actually get the testing to work, how to get the results out of it, how to actually put into our libraries where Maven spits out test results, it spits out code coverage, Visual Studio or MS Build kicks out test results, um, end unit test results, we, we've got Phantom running, we've got um, Sauce Labs running, Selenium stuff, we've just got all sorts of different things, how do we capture all of that and actually bring it all together in one place? And then, of course, automated deployments. <laughs> so, so, so that's the big part. And once again, I'll, I'll stress on that. If you have to have somebody deploying your code, it's going to fail. And it's going to fail every time, or 60% of the time at least. Um, and, and a big part of that is coming up with the standard and how we want to do it, how we can actually touch servers that a human has never had the ability to point a script at because it requires a different team to log in, and it requires a different team to own that server, and a different team says, well, you can't touch that. We, we can't automate against that because it's against the rules. Security won't let us. So how do we come up with a standard that we can actually do that? We do have an easy path, and the easy path is our internal private cloud. And part of our adoption has been really starting with the low-hanging fruit and starting with the teams that we knew could adopt CI and practically CD, which is where we're going eventually, um, pretty easily. And when you don't have to provision servers, when you don't have to go through all that process, and you've got a PaaS solution, it's great. And that was kind of a quick win, slam dunk, let's go through it. The bigger problem was everything else. How do we get to deploy code in the enterprise and touch servers that we've never been able to touch. Uh, we went down a couple different paths and a couple different things and we thought about it different ways. One, how do we deploy code? Two, how do we make sure dependencies are out there um, that aren't code related but they're needed for us to run? And we settled on Ansible as a solution because we can actually hook into pretty much everything in the enterprise. We can store our secrets um, for actually deploying. We can hook into all the different aspects of what we're doing and have a standardized, secure way. And then take that even a step further and say, okay, we're not keeping our inventory of where we're putting code in spreadsheets anymore. We are taking that and we are putting it in inventory files that live with the code. So if I wanna know where I'm actually deploying something, all I have to do is look at my code repo and I know where my targets are. I know where they are for dev, I know where they are for QA, I know where they are for production. If I need to change that, and it becomes a bit of a federated model where it's no longer somebody else's responsibility. It's me as the ownership of my application to say, all right, we're adding new servers as a part of this, we're adding new capacity on this legacy farm, somebody built them up, but I need to be able to deploy that. I'm responsible for making sure that my deployment targets are actually sitting there living with my code and I can do that stuff. So that was about it for what we're doing. Um, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of what we have. And at this point, you know, if you guys wanna interrupt for questions, go into a little bit more detail, we can do that. If you want me to just stop for questions at the end, we can do that as well, but I do have some sample code in here of what we've done um, and how we've done it. But our basic Jenkins file looks like that. And, and that is from a purely simple, what do we do, how do we get people on board with our global libraries, is we build out a Jenkins file, they drop it in there and they say, my application name is that, my build type is Spring PCF. And I'm going to get a build, I'm gonna get a test, I'm gonna get a publish um, on that. If I wanted to take it a little bit forward and my clicking may or may not work here. Nope, so I've got it queued up. All right, um, take it a little bit further. Really? Sorry guys.
take it a little bit further, I can then say, all right, I want to deploy to QA and I want to deploy to production. And here are the settings and the parameters I need to deploy to QA and production for this application. Um, I wish I could. My Zoom is actually not working, but I can actually provide all of these files. I apologize. Um, so basically, we are setting properties for our app names and our routes in our different environments. We're saying, okay, when I deploy to QA, I actually want to test that endpoint. When I route from blue to green on a hot cold deployment, I want to test that endpoint after my routing step. Um, and prod, the same stuff. And then my actual call into my pipeline library looks the same. It's my build type, my application name, and then a little bit information. Um, what do I want to do from HipChat? Do I want to integrate and tell people that I'm actually deploying this stuff? Um, what Jira projects is stuff li linked to? If I want to customize what I'm doing from a how I build, I get to override parameters and say, all right, these are my new build goals. If I just want to keep the basic, I leave that out and I'm just doing a clean install every time. Um, and then my post-deploy testing, I just pass all that stuff in there and boom, it's the same process. And that's really it. What we did is we created wrappers. So for all of the different build types. So you saw Spring PCF over there. But we also have things like Broad Vision, Data Power, .NET Builds, .NET Websites, uh, Freestyle, and I'll show you guys that in a few minutes. Um, iOS, Mainframe, uh, Legacy Maven stuff that doesn't live in PCF. Um, components, if we're just publishing components that don't have deploy aspects, that all we want to do is publish libraries. Um, Node stuff, React components, and so on and so forth. And you can see all that stuff just sitting over here on the left. And they're really shells, and they are predefined workflows. Uh, we do have the ability in, in that freestyle build, and I do have an example of that, to let teams actually define their own. And in doing that, define their own build steps, their own um, published steps, their own testing steps, and then still utilize all of the hooks for either the PCF deployments or the Ansible deployments, as well as all the hooks into JIRA, into ServiceNow, into we're using Excel release, and I'll show you those workflows for our release management aspects of things to really pull it all together. Um, entry points. So this is just kind of an example when I showed you the ESI build flow a little bit ago. This takes you in of what that actually does. And coming in there is basically our entry point that says, all right, let's set all my parameters based on what they passed in. So in that closure that the people are passing in and putting in that build goals and overriding those steps, um, let, let's actually create that. We'll take the defaults if they're there, if they're not there, and I've got that on the next slide. If they're not there, we'll just take the defaults for basically that build type and what we're doing. Um, and then really run the build and whatever that method is for that build. So that build type that came in, whether it's a Spring PCF build, if it's a React component, run that piece and run that workflow for the teams. Um, as a part of that, then we've got our logging all built into that. We've got our build statuses and then we've got a finalized build in there. And that finalized is our hooks into JIRA, our hooks into things like log parser. Um, additional logging, um, additional notifications, and things like that. So as we add new functionality, teams are going to get all of that for free. Uh, this is just an example of our setting the build parameters I was talking about, and there's a ton of stuff in here, um, just on the different defaults that are in there, setting Jenkins environment variables as a part of the stuff we're passing around. Um, setting templates, setting our build goals. So if you're passing it in, it's great, otherwise it's null, and then the build type that's actually getting that is gonna set it. So if it's an MS, um, a .NET build, it's gonna call MS build and it's gonna send in certain parameters for your packaging. If it's a Maven build, it's gonna send in clean install um, for whatever it is, or they can pass it in and we're gonna get that. Um, and here's just an example of our Maven stuff just so you guys can see kind of how we're doing our blocks and what our workflow looks like. So as we go through it, the 
we've got our checkout stage. Um, it goes and it uses just a common build steps checkout, which just uh, does a pipeline SCM checkout based on what they're doing. Um, and for different build types, it's actually going through and for Maven, it's reading your POM file and going through that and actually setting all your versions as part of the build. So it's grabbing your POM file, grabbing your artifact name, your group, and setting everything up for publishing based on that. Um, for .NET, obviously, it's reading your assembly files and different steps along the way on how you're gonna do that for your different build types. But it is set up to do all that stuff for you. Um, freestyle sample, this one's kinda cool. So on this one, we're defining our steps and we've got our checkout closure, we've got our build closure, we've got our test closure, our publish closure, and then we are letting them actually use their deployments that we already have built in, the Ansible stuff or the PCF stuff. And that's gonna key off of those parameters I showed you at first, or it's gonna key off your deploy YAML stuff for Ansible that's located in your repo. So you are defining all of that, but you're getting the workflows through the environments, you're getting our release management procedures, you're getting all the different aspects of that built into this. Um, and as a part of that, I actually have a example. Am I doing that time? All right. Um, an example on our freestyle stuff. So on the freestyle builds, if you guys look, and once again, I apologize for not being able to zoom on this, but our checkout closure, we're basically setting it all up. We're passing in our parameters that we set up earlier, um, deleting our directories, doing our builds for this, um, grabbing something else from Git, um, doing a full checkout, using a, some stashes, doing some debugging, setting artifact versions and all of that. Um, same concept with our build closure, calling our build scripts. This was a Windows-based freestyle batch build that builds an EDI product. So once again, not everybody fits into the same box. Um, so they've got their custom steps, they've got their testing, they've got their publishing, and then when they call that ESI build flow, they're just passing those blocks in. The build closure, the checkout closure, the test closure, and the publish closure. And that's getting picked up, once again, by these and running as part of those stages. Deployments, um, very common, very easy, the way we're doing it. So this one was a Maven Spring build, uh, Spring PCF. And at the bottom, after our build stuff, and after we call our base build steps from our Maven builds, we're just calling PCF deploy and passing in our parameters object that has all of the information about how to deploy it everything that we set up initially. Um, for everything else, we're using Ansible and we're just calling a common function Ansible deploy and it's running our Ansible steps. It's using the Jenkins Ansible uh, plugin and passing in the playbook name that we're getting out of their repo and running all the steps that they have defined in there. And I do have examples of these guys if you have any questions. Um, as far as releases, so using the pipeline and you know, we've got our checkout, we've got our different stages and our different flows, our routing, and then at the very end, we do a requ request release. And that is making a call to X, uh, Excel release, uh, ZB Labs product, they're out there. And it's really a workflow system. So we could have done everything in Jenkins pipeline. Um, as we all know, based on the code we're showing, it's not necessarily release management friendly. It's not something that they're going to drag and drop different steps to connect to ServiceNow, to connect to JIRA, to uh, run queries against JIRA and things like that. It's more of a tool that actually does different workflows and gets approvals and sets gates and does notifications and things like that that our release management team can get out of the SharePoint world, get out of the email world and move to something automated. So Jenkins is then calling this request release passing in our JIRA project, passing in our JIRA fixed version that they actually want to tie to in JIRA, and XLR is really putting it all together. Uh, at the end, XLR then calls to another Jenkins job, which runs our production deployment. And we actually have this one secured, so it's only called by XLR. So for our production deployments, 
Um, XLR is really the only user who can do it, or our release management team and different AD groups. But that is using the initial Jenkins package, or the parameters that we created as a part of our builds. Uh, we take that, we actually zip it up, we throw it up into Artifactory. When XLR gets the Jenkins build information, it knows where that deployment package is, grabs that art out of Artifactory, and sends in those JSON files to Jenkins, in the location of that. And then Jenkins is using the initial build stuff and all of the information we created earlier during the build and deploying, updating, uh, deploying or routing, depending on what was coming in, and doing the production deployment, releasing the Jira version, and finalizing everything. Um, and you can see we've got our deploying XLR release, our release number, and all that stuff on our routing process, which actually turned it live. Um, the finalized stuff I was talking about for how we actually put things together is just a sample of at the end of our build, we run that block and it writes logs, it updates Jira with our inclusion of our ticket numbers that we put into our check-in requests or our check-ins. Um, it calls our log parsing, it does notifying from whether it be hip chat or email, whatever they defined as a part of their Jenkins file and kills it all. And then I just have some random other stuff that I put in there. Uh, testing. So our pipeline libraries, what we've done is part of building this is actually intersourced it. So rather than us trying to create the workflows for the different tech stacks that we have, we've been giving that to the teams and telling the teams, all right, we've built the shell, we've built the framework for you guys. So now help us actually deploy your application and build your application. So the, the different build types you saw, most of those have been provided to us from our teams to go through and say, hey, we need a build type for this. And then we ask them, all right, so we're creating the shell, we're creating the build type, help us with the workflow. And so as a part of that, we actually have to test our pipeline. And that kind of sucks if anybody's worked with pipeline. Um, so we, we've implemented the stock framework and done a bunch of workflows around it. Unit tests are easy. Actual functional tests are the hardest thing I've ever tried to figure out. Uh, but they do work. They just take a little bit of time. But it does allow us to actually test our pipeline code. So every time we check in to our global pipeline library um, on our develop branch, we actually do a build and a test on the pipeline library. And we have set up our pipeline library as a Maven project. So while Jenkins is only reading it when it runs, imports the library, when we check it in, it's actually set up as a Maven project and we can do an actual build on it. And the Maven POM is, and I do have a link in here to our Maven POM, it is bringing in a lot of the Jenkins core dependencies on how to actually test that so it can compile the code. Uh, creating pipelines, and this is one of the onboarding things I was talking about earlier. And it's just DSL, and we just made it easy for the teams. They put in their Jenkins folder where they want to use it. We are on the CloudBees CJP platform, so we do have secured folders at the top level there. Um, so where they want it, um, the GitHub repo owner and the repo name. And it basically spits out a dashboard for their build, as well as different tabs for feature branches, pull requests, and 2.0 kind of makes that a little bit different and changing things on that. Um, we're in a migration process right now, so DSL will change just slightly. But yeah, so that makes things a little bit easier to do. Um, that's really it, so. Any questions? That's the one thing I said was really, really hard. Okay. So, I will actually bring you in there. So, we've got a test folder in here. And we are using, let's go to one of the easier ones. That is really just... Let's see if you guys can see this. And I don't know why Zoom doesn't work in IntelliJ also. So I do apologize. Um, but basically, we're just setting up our parameters. So we're setting up our, this one is to get the job repository. So what do we want to see? We're passing in the current build to it. And it needs to read from our build configuration where our um, GitHub repo is. And it, it's getting that repo for us. So obviously we have to mock out the raw build 
because we don't have access to those objects as part of Maven because those are Jenkins built in. Uh, so we are setting that raw build parent, parent sources, source repository, my repository name, um, and setting the repo name as a get job repository, pulling in that information and asserting on the repo name. And if you look at that run, hopefully it works. Boom, it actually worked, cool. Um, so, so I mean, that, that's the simple, simple unit test case, right? Um, to get you a little bit more detailed, we are setting up um, calls and functional tests for overall flows. Those are extremely time consuming. <laughs> and, and, and it was one of, it was more of a POC to start uh, so we built out a couple samples for our unit testing and then built out these guys to go through, but you know, there's a whole lot of mocking because we have to mock all of the Jenkins workflow libraries. But as a part of that, we're setting our repos, coming through there, um, binding variables to different stuff, the current build, that's what that's pulling from, our environment variables, our branch names, um, tokens coming in from different things, the when you, if you use anything that comes from, or that uses Jenkins workflow stuff, you can't just invoke the objects. You actually have to load in the scripts. So um, I saw Jesse Glick actually posted a test framework recently, and this is what a lot of this was built on. Um, it is somewhat complex to have to do that, and, but I can give you some examples, and if you wanna email me later, I'd be happy to help. So, yes. We actually put them into the shared library. So, um, okay, so the question for anybody who hasn't heard was, is each team actually producing a shared library that then gets invoked um, by the global library or do they actually build in into our global library? Uh, the way we currently have it is they're building in. I do, as we get larger, I do wanna actually separate some of that stuff, but we're using the functionality so, um, when you go through and if you guys are familiar with the libraries for testing that stuff, so we, we do work off of GitHub, we do work on a pull request basis for actually merging them in. Our ESI build library that you saw from the very beginning, um, here, let me just pull one up here, that you saw from the very beginning is Um, from the very beginning is just called ESI build. Uh, with the global pipeline libraries, they do have the ability to append a feature branch to that. So as they build out their things, they get to test their code in their own branch, in the own branch of the library, to actually test their workflows. So, you know, there's only so many different variations across the enterprise. We do have, you know, probably 10 different flows active right now that you know, probably a thousand different um, builds and applications are using across that. So there is a lot of reuse. It's not every team is building their own. You know, when we actually get a platform, we're like, oh, you wanna build on WebSphere v with Ant. Uh, we don't wanna support that, but we will help you. And so as doing that, they become the guinea pigs to really be the first ones to do it to help us actually build that. And we guide them through it, we work with them on how to actually build that stuff out, how to get it in there, how not to put inputs within node blocks, things like that that are going to hose up the system. But um, 
you know, it, it does become kind of a common practice, and it seems to garner buy-in a lot better with the teams because it's them actually learning it and learning how it's going to work and learning how their builds are going to work and how their process is going to work, being able to bring that to us versus us saying, hey, you guys need to do it this way. So does that answer your question? Pretty much. I mean, we do have some other shared libraries out there. Uh, we've got a utils library that a couple teams are using for doing some like performance testing and things like that. But for our main workflow, this is really our main workflow because we do want the procedures. As a company our size, uh, we do need to standardize the procedures if we are going to, I shouldn't use standardize, um, have a pattern around our procedures if we are going to move faster and be able to actually allow teams a little bit more freedom, we do have to have that accountability and that traceability. So we have kind of brought it all together to do that. Um, we don't want just teams going rogue and doing all their own things, because then we have the sprawl that really got us into the problem in the first place. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, 100%. Yes? There's a pretty big human aspect to it. Um, you know, our pull requests, we do try to keep them small. And we do have a core team that is looking at them and reviewing every one as a very small team that's doing that um, to make sure that we are following the rules, that we aren't doing anything rogue, that we aren't doing anything really out of the ordinary. Um, question for anybody who didn't hear it is, do we have any sort of scanning or um, capabilities, automated capabilities within our review process to make sure people aren't putting anything in that is going to hurt us. And so, yeah, I mean, it is somewhat of a manual process at this point. Um, you know, it, it's more of working with the teams to figure out how they need to build their code and being able to help them integrate that than saying, hey, go, go out on your own, so. And, and you mentioned that you're using Excel only and Windows, right? Yes. Okay, um, actually, I've, I'll go back to the slide real quick. The question was, how does Jenkins interact with Excel release? Excel release is really the, there you go. Uh, it's the soft skills aspect of what we're doing. So Jenkins calls to Excel as a part of that last step in the pipeline, it requests a release. It starts off a template in Excel that does our planning, gets all the JIRA items, runs rules around, uh, whether JIRA, all the tickets for that fixed version are actually accepted in accepted state before it moves forward. Um, it contacts ServiceNow and it gets approvals through ServiceNow and does that integration. It sends out emails, hip chat notifications, it sets gates for when people actually do need to approve from an RM to make sure all the boxes are ticked. Uh, at the very end, when it goes to do the build, it actually calls back to Jenkins, and that's what this slide was. And Jenkins does the actual deployment. Based on that Excel release ID, it verifies that it's there. It does it based on the package that Jenkins initially built and told Excel, this is what we want to deploy. And then it goes and deploys it. So Jenkins does all the heavy lifting. Excel release is more of the soft skills, the release management aspects to get us out of SharePoint and email. Uh, all of our spring teams are probably on board in about 10 minutes. Um, our legacy teams, usually maybe a week or so to actually start understanding and get on board. Um, like I said, it's a couple of clicks of a button. The question was, how long does it take teams to get on board? Uh, we started building this about a year ago. And like I said, we started with low-hanging fruit, the, the cloud-based teams that were more easily onboarding and, and also a little bit more apt to adopt new technologies. Um, 
And so, you know, really we started laying the groundwork about a year ago and probably been full force at it for about six months. And a lot of that was paperwork of trying to get our risk management people to allow us to deploy stuff. So, yes? Okay, uh, question is how do we manage dependencies from a Jenkins build aspect? Answer is Docker. So we're doing our builds in Docker containers. So we have a Docker container for RPM builds. We have a Docker container for Spring builds. We have a Docker container for Ansible deployments. Um, and so for different types of technologies, we've got one for Node stuff. Um, where we actually need that, we're using Docker to actually build in. So we don't actually have to install all of that stuff in there, and we are pulling all of our dependencies from Artifactory. So we do have a binary repo that we just pull everything in, and we use Artifactory to proxy out to Maven Public and things like that. So what's the definition of that? Hmm? Is, is that defined in the, um, uh, in the Jenkins file, or is that? So the Jenkins file actually has an ability to, I don't think I show or have an example of that there, so I'll just pull it up in the code. Um, one of the parameters, so, is Docker build image. So by default, it comes in null, we're not using Docker to do that. Um, if they pass it in, they can use a specific image that's already up in Artifactory. If not, when I look at, for instance, my Maven base build, uh, where are we at? Maven's rebuilt in, actually let me just look at a React build, it's probably a little easier. There you go. So our Docker build image on the React is our DevOps slash node build and it's a stable release tag. And we're actually using Jenkins Pipeline to build our Docker images as well. So we've got our latest and then we promote to a stable release. And so by default we're using stable release, but if we do want to override with some sort of new functionality or new dependencies, we can do that and override those settings. We're trying. Uh, the question is, do we centralize our test results? Uh, we are putting a lot of the information into Graphite for a lot of the results. Um, as a time series data, it's not necessarily the best place. So we're working on moving over to Elk and to actually start capturing all of that. But yeah, I mean, we do have it per build. We've got, you know, if you look at, for instance, on our Maven builds, as part of the test step, we actually have common methods for publishing X unit, publishing co uh, coverage, and checkmark scanning. So we do security checking and things like that in there. If the data is there as an output of the build, it's going to do that. If it's not, it's just going to pass over and it's not going to do it. But that's part of that. Uh, with the .NET, for instance, we've got publishing end unit stuff in here. So, yes. I do. Um, I don't know if I have an example, but I actually have a Jenkins job. I just cleaned up my desktop, so I may not. Uh, I don't, but I can show you one. Um, Wait, graphics aren't going to show just because they're hosted somewhere else. Maybe. Maybe the file won't even show. <laughs> Downloading proxy script. All right, one second. Maybe. 
it's a large file. Um, but I, I, we actually have some Groovy scripts that run on a once a day basis that traverse the object model and look through all of our builds and grab all the coverage results, all the test results, put it into a JSON file or an XML file also, and just run like an XSL against it and spit out this report that may or may not actually come up. Try that one. We do, and part of that is, so at the one slide where I showed you the endpoint testing, we actually have different test objects that we can use um, that we can call an external test job, that we can call, like post deployment, that we can call um, you know, a different Maven build or a test call within that Maven job, or we can call Cucumber testing. We can call different types of testing in different scripts post deployment as a part of that build and we tell it after you do route QA, we want to run this test and that's part of the pipeline flow. Anything else? Yes? It is. Um, I, I hope that Yeah, I, I wish it was easy. Um, part, part of the difficulty, if it was all just the cloud team, it, it'd be awesome. But because we do have so many legacy applications and so many different legacy build types and so many different platforms out there, um, to try to get people on board and to streamline that process while we're doing the agile transformation would be impossible. And so we're, we're trying to really give everybody kickstart as part of that. And that's where it seems complex to us. And our complexity tries to lead to simplicity for them. The test result is actually in the Jenkins. Ah, there we go. Um, in the Jenkins builds. So we traverse through the build object and pull out um, if there's like a, you know, if you ever look at your build and just look at the build results and hit the JSON API or the XML API and do like depth two, I think it is, in the API, you can see the model actually has all the test results as a part of that. So we traverse through the model, look through it. So this is back in November of 2016. Uh, a report and it showed 476 builds and just different coverage and this is a really old report that I had to find out in my downloads folder so I apologize the data is not up to date but these are our high level Jenkins folders and then like if we were to dig down into one of these guys we can actually see the different builds for them each individual build total tests last run dates and all the information about them line coverage and all the test results. We good? This is traversing the entire Jenkins model. Oh. Everything we have in Jenkins. Oh, okay. So, and it takes about 12 seconds to run. So it's just Groovy. It's just a Groovy script running back there that just runs on a daily basis. I filter out the ones with admin or. Spring Music Sample in the name. But yes. <laughs> yes? Is, is that that you have, you have a Chrome like, uh, system that you're showing us here. Um, do you take into account uh, all the different queries and so forth? Um, um, it, how do you motivate those teams, or do you motivate those teams to uh, conform to some sort of standard? How do we motivate the teams to conform to a standard? Or do you even do that? We do. Uh, the first motivation is you guys get to move faster. And, and that's a big part of it. You don't have to fill out all the paperwork. You don't have to wait for somebody to deploy your code. Um, step two is we make it harder and harder to get through the old process. So you know, as you go through, it's like, all right, well, now we have reallocated the team that was doing your manual deployments. 
Now there's fewer people to do that. Your queue is going to get longer and longer to actually do that. And it's going to be harder and harder. And step three at the end is we just cut it off. And it, it has to get to that point. So when, when it gets to the point that we are fully transformed as an organization and there's little pockets that are doing things manually, your code's not going to production because you're not in the system and we don't have the manual process anymore. So it's a lot of evangelism on my part to work with the teams and try to get people on board and it does end up setting some hard dates on deprecation for different aspects of the systems. Like right now we're trying to kill off CVS. Um, so you know all the teams that are still checking code in there, we have to say, all right, how, how many teams are doing it? Why aren't you in the system? And we're turning off the lights at the end of September. So let's move. And we've given you the steps. We've given you the process. And that's part of the complexity that we've done is we've built the process for them to move over easily. So now they just have to adopt it. And if they don't, then it becomes an escalation issue. And nobody really wants that. So cool. I think we are about out of time. So. Thanks, all.